1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. Philistines started it. It is their doing. And were gathered together at Shokol, which belongeth to Judah. So the Philistines are in Israel's land. They're the instigators. That's going to be just a little important in a minute. And pitched between Soko and Azekah in Ephesus, Deminim, Deminim. And Saul, the king, and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in ray against the Philistines. All right. The Philistines come for battle. Saul, defensive. Philistines offensive. Saul and the men of Israel defensive. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. So here's two mountains, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion. That's only three times in the Bible. And it's going to talk about this chapter, Goliath. The only champion in the Bible, this is the first time it shows up is a giant of the enemy of Israel. So be careful of champions or breakfast of champions. Aren't those the two mountains that Moses had them say the blessing was in the first one? No, that was evil. Evil and uh, another one. So the champion is not of God. Out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, because that's the first time his name showed up. Of Gath, Philistine territory, whose height was six cubits and a span. That would be approximately nine foot nine inches. Approximately. And a minimum of Jewish people is usually around five foot seven inches. I mean, Jewish people are kind of short. So he'd be a giant. And if you ever seen the explanation of some of these places that they dig up these giants from, and he had a helmet of brass, and brass is judgment in the Bible, upon his head. That's the first time helmet shows up. And it goes on his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail. That's the first time that shows up. And it's that coat that's all different chains, linkage. And when you go drive a sword, they would stop the sword. And the weight of the coat now here we go. How strong is this guy? 5,000 shekels of brass. That would be approximately 150 pounds. Just that male. Not counting everything else he's got on. Not counting himself. And he had greaves. That's the first and last time that shows up. And that is like a shin guard. A brass upon his leg. Look at all the brass. Judgment. And a target. That's a small shield. Kind of funny. Uh, here's a guy. Here's anybody going out to battle. Okay. First time target shows up in the Bible. And here. What's this? Oh, it's a shield. Oh, okay. What's this? It's a helmet. Cool. I like that. What's that? Here's a coat of mail. Oh, that's interesting. What's this? It's a target. That would be the last word you want to be a soldier in the military. I am wearing a target. A brass between his shoulders. And like I said, it's a shield of some kind. It goes where his breast is. Be a breastplate. Kind of, not a breastplate. And again, if it's between his shoulders, isn't that like where your chest is? Your 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 breast? Isn't that a stupid place to be called a target with your heart and your lungs there? And when you see that target of that man, aim. Never mind the white of his eyes. When we go out to battle against the soldiers, aim for their target. I mean, that would be the simplest, easiest command that your soldiers would know about. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, that weaver's first time. I can't find a picture of this. I can't find... It's a... It's an instrument used with a weaver's beam. 
when they made the the weaver stuff. And his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron. That would be about twenty-five pounds. Iron is not a good thing in the Bible, never mind brass. Iron has no good condensation in it. And one bearing the shield went before him. So this guy has got all this armor, and then he has somebody who goes out before him and holds his shield. I hope that this shield would be bigger than the guy holding it. I mean, they didn't hold flags back then. They held the shields to protect the soldiers. Uh, went before him. In other words, this guy went in front of him. You need a shield in front of you. So Goliath can do all his weaponry. You can't do all your weaponry and then have to hold a, sh a shield. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Uh, verse 1 said you guys did it. That's why I pointed that out between verses 1 and 2. The Philistines are the offense. The Israelites are the defense. You're the reason why we're out here. <laughs> this guy is so naive that, you know what, we're just supposed to come march in and do whatever we want to do, and why are you opposing us? That's the context. Am I, am not I a Philistine? So that Philistine was, I mean, that giant was a Philistine. And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man, from you and let him come down off the mountain to me. So he wants hand to hand combat. Now, mind the groups of men, you just bring one of your men down to me and we'll battle it out. If he be able to fight me and kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and servants. Well, there's there's a 50-50. If I lose, you win. If I win, you lose. It's not bad. Just find yourself the most strongest and, and man that can be trusted of Israel. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Then they know an answer. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly feared, greatly afraid. Isn't that the conduct of Saul in this military all along? Yeah, Saul, yeah, Saul's the tallest man, the whole group. Go get him, Saul. <laughs> but you know what? I give one credit to Saul. And a few U.S. presidents that we've had over the, the modern ones. We are battling in, a, in, a, in Iraq today. We are b battling in Afghanistan. We're battling all over the Middle East. Their king is there in the battle, too. Where's our president in the battle? Saul and his sons are in the battle, and they will die in the battle. Where is the president? Where have the presidents and their sons? I think that would eliminate the war. Well, I think we should go in there and fight for the oil because we need to. Okay, well, declaration of, order of, of war. Mr. President, here's your shield, here's your sword, and here's your armor. You and your boys go out first. What? That's the Bible. How many presidents have never served the military? And yet they're the commander in chief of the military. Isn't that something wrong? Saul is called the captain of Israel, and he's out there in the battle. You know what happens in the Bible when, when the captain, the king of Israel, did not go out to battle? He committed adultery and defiled his, his military men by killing one of them. I'm just saying. You want to clean up Washington, D.C.? When they start a war, let them go out there and fight it. Going by the Bible, and Saul and all Israel heard these words of those, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And that just shows that's been all through since Saul's been a military leader. Fear. Now, David was the son of the Ephronite of Bethlehem, Judah. That's 
There's two Bethlehems, the one of Judah. That's remarkable because that's where Jesus will be born of this family. Make sure you don't think it's the other Bethlehem. Make sure you don't think it's any other family in Bethlehem. Whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. I don't understand. He couldn't fight. Because uh, it says, And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to battle. And the names of the three sons that went to battle were Eliab the firstborn, next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shema. And David was the youngest of the eight, and the three eldest followed Saul. So, here we go. But David went and returned from Saul. So back here when we read, they inquired David to play his heart before the evil spirit and saw David goes home. Maybe because of this battle. We'll look at some things as we read. David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. He's a shepherd. So David never witnesses what's going on. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days at the time of the morning and evening sacrifices of the lord this philistine is coming out 40 the number of testing and he's challenging 40 times every morning every evening and jesse said unto david his son take now for thy brethren an ephah of parched corn and these ten loaves bread and run to the camp to thy brethren give them some food encourage them and carry these ten cheeses that's the only place that shows up cheeses ten of them unto the captain of the thousand so take the corn and the bread to the troops are your brothers to their leaders, bring them the cheeses of the thousands. And look how thy brethren fare. First time that shows up. And take their pledge. Now that pledge shows up 22, in the, 22 times in the Bible. In Genesis 38, 17, the harlot, who's his uh, daughter-in-law, says to Judah, what pledge will you give me? Exodus 22, 26, Deuteronomy 24, 6, 24 and 10 to 13, verse 17. Talk about you're not to sleep with the guy's pledge. You know, if, if they give you a coat, if they give you the millstone, you're to return it. So what David, I mean, what Jesse is saying to David, not, you know, not they owe us money, but bring something to tell me that they're okay, they're alive. Bring their dirty laundry. Bring something that I know they haven't died in battle. Now Saul and they that and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting, that's the first time that shows up, with the Philistines. So there are conflicts and battles going on. And David rose up early in the morning. They all do. <laughs> and left the sheep with a keeper. He's not careless. I got a job by my father. Here, you take care of my sheep. And took and went as Jesse had commanded him, does what his father tells him to do. Type of Jesus Christ. And he came to the trench, first time that shows up, trench warfare, as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. They're about to go into battle. Yay, here comes the banner, here comes the trumpets, we're going to battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper. Here's another, you know, watch my stuff, watch the carriage. He's responsible. He's prudent, we read the Bible says. 
and ran into the army. It's kind of funny because look at verse 17. At the end of the verse, Jesse told him, run to the camp. And over here, verse 22, and ran into, that's exactly what his father told him to do. David, I almost said Jacob, David follows everything that his father tells him to, to the T. You want me to run? I ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. As he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, that's the second of three times, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, verse 9, and David heard them for the first time. Now he witnesses. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. I mean, all the, I mean, all right, yeah, he wants one man to come fight face to face. Why don't you guys just take him down with your arrows right now? Why didn't Saul just say, okay, ready, fire! No, he's dead. That's what I would have done. That guy comes out, I defy your gods, right? Now I would say, hey, you know, he comes out every morning and evening, guys. Tomorrow evening, when he comes out, I want you to load your arrows, I want you to load your rocks, I want you to load your swords and get ready. And when I give the command, shoot him down. Why didn't they do that? An entire army of over a thousand afraid of one man. I don't know. That's what I think about this. Right? And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defile Israel has he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich first time. And next time that word shows up, Ezekiel 27, 33. I always think when I see that word, I think of enriched flour. Will enrich him with great riches. And will give him his daughter. This is where David marries into the family, but Saul changes it. That come up. And make his father's house free in Israel. From what? No more taxes. If he has any debt, it will be paid. That's a great honor. And Jesse never sent David to do this. Jesse didn't have any idea about the David didn't have anything into now. And David spake to the men. That stood by him saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine? And take away the reproach of Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defile the armies of the... Listen, why ain't you guys going down there killing him? That's David's question. Yeah, you'd be made, you know, to marry the, the king's uh, daughter. Your family would be free. You'll get this money. Well, why isn't anybody stepping down there for God, the living God? Never mind the daughter. Never mind the money. Never mind the freedom. What about God? We're the children of God, aren't we? And he's been doing it for 40 days. And the people who answer him this after this manner, you know, the the daughter, the money, the freedom, saying, "So it be done unto the man that killeth him." And Elad, the eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the man, unto the man. And Elad's anger was kindled against David. And he said, "Why camest thou thither?" Dad told him. <laughs> And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Ooh, attitude. Attitude. <laughs> I know thy pride, David. Pride? I don't think so. And the naughtiness of thy heart. Well, okay. All have seen come short of the glory of God, but that pride? No. Not David. For thou art come down that thou mayest see the battle. Uh, what battle? The guy came out and everybody ran away. David's like, where are you guys going? There's no battle right now. 
And David said, what have I, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Yet yeah, dad sent me. Dad sent me to give you some bread. If you keep it up, big brother, you'll get the last of the bread. I'll get everybody first. I'm the one with the food. I'll go back and tell dad you're misbehaving. And he turned from him toward another. <laughs> and Spank has, his brother balls him out. Oh, hey, I got, and then he turns to another soldier and starts talking to him. And this, I don't care about you, brother. Spank after this manner. And the people answered him again after the former. Why is it, David's questioning, why is it not anybody going down there? And they keep saying, you get the daughter, you get the money. And he's saying, well, why not God? Don't you have faith in God? And when the words were heard, which David spank, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. So Saul gets what little David's saying. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, the Goliath. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Me. I'll go. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. 1618. Chapter 16, verse 18. Let's see what the Bible says about David. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, that is a cunning player, playing, and a mighty man of valor, a man of war. Yeah, I think he's able, according to what the men have said about him. I think he's completely able to do it. But, you know, you're just so afraid and you've taken your mind off everything. So, you know, fear makes you say things that you don't. David, again, we talked about this last night. He's standing there. He's no wimp. We're going to see in a moment. This guy is probably muscular. He's probably tall. And he's probably rugged. He sleeps with sheep out in a plaster all night long. It rains upon him. It gets cold upon him. He's battling animals to make sure that he, they don't get his sheep. There are robbers and thieves come. He deals with them. He has free time to, to play and practice with his uh, slingshot and his rod. He's not American. This guy would be considered, David would be considered a SEAL team member. He says, I'll go. And David said to Saul, now watch this. Here's a testimony. Thy servant kept his father's sheep. See, they're not my sheep. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And there came a lion, the devil, and a bear, the Antichrist, and took a lamb out of the flock. <laughs> the devil's taking some sheep. And by the way, it came together. A lion and a bear. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth, the sheep. Took him right out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. I killed him and got that sheep back. That's Jesus Christ on Calvary where he won the victory over death. And anybody that will believe on Jesus Christ, I'll rip you right out of the mouth of Satan and the Holy Spirit will adopt you into the family. And there are too many preachers out there when the sheep go away. Bye. Oh, they hated me. They hated the church. They went to do other things. And when that guy had 99 sheep and one went away, what did he do? He went and got them. And it was rejoicing. David would not let one sheep, one sheep. He went and fought for that sheep. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. 
Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. So Goliath is a type of Antichrist. He's a type of Satan. And he's the champion. Where are champions in the Bible? They're of the devil. Take that for interesting. Seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. There's that living God. He's made fun of Israel, and Israel is God's. And that's what David's been going up and down with the troops. Listen, we are the children of God, you fools. You wimps. We ought to be out there in faith in God to win. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. That's the only two places Paul shows up. The lion and the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of those things. That's exactly what he's been telling those troops. We serve the living God and living God should bring that man down. You have no faith. He walks up to Saul and says, listen, this is what God's done for me. That bear and that lion, they're dead. That sheep was saved. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to treat that giant just like that. And God is going to give me the victory. Faith. And he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go. And the Lord be with thee. I, I thought he was just a youth and of no character. Saul changed his mind real quick. Isn't it good that David didn't tell a lie? Isn't it great that David did not fib? What if he was just telling a story to make himself better than what he was? He'd be in big trouble. Be careful of your lies. Then Saul armed David with his armor. Uh, aren't you supposed to be wearing it? And he put a helmet of brass, like uh, Goliath, upon his head, also armed with a coat of mail, like Goliath. And David girded his sword upon his armor. And he is saved, and he's about to go. And he had not proved it. He's never had a sword. He never had armor. He never had a helmet. He never had a shield. He doesn't know how to use them. They are not accustomed to his body and his features and his hands. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. For I have not proved them. I have no training. And David put them on him. And what we're going to do is we're going to stop right there because the story is wonderful. It's great. That, you know, let's hurry up and finish because we're running out of time. We'll run right there. We'll leave David right there. He takes... Now, here's the, here's the situation here. If Saul was, in, was wearing that armor, he's taking it off and giving it on David. David's putting it on. This armor has been taken off twice. And David says, I don't know how to use it. Well, also, that would be putting his faith in the armor and not yep. the Lord. Yep. And another thing the Bible says, as far as that sword... Study to show thyself approved unto God, a working that needs not to be ashamed, but the divine. David would be up there if he'd be flumping with that sword. But those rocks and that uh, uh, that slingshot, he knows. But like Tracy said, when he grabs that rock, he's Lord God. You take this rock and you get it right where it counts, and it got him right where it counts, right in the third eye. And that giant goes down, dead. One shot. It's a remarkable story. And what you get out of this whole entire chapter, which are probably Sunday schools are not teaching children, this is a story of faith over armor. Oh, I've got to get my gun. I've got to get my gun license because, you know, the, the world's going too crazy and all that. i got to arm myself. And the government wants to take my, my gun from me. David puts that sword on. I said, I ain't ready for this. Just give me Jesus and a rock. Maybe not Jesus, but give me Jehovah and a rock. Wait a minute. What did I say? 
I said Jehovah and the rock, and that rock is Jesus. That rock is Jesus. I forget how that hymn goes. The only one. He said he had four others, because Goliath has other brothers. You know what Dave was ready that afternoon? Not only take down Goliath, but if his brothers poked their head. Boom, boom, boom. And Saul's going to get angry. But like I said, this battle is an interesting battle, and we will save it for another night, Lord willing.